Well, a very good morning to all of you, FBC, and also those who are in Zoom now. We can't see the, uh, the faces anymore. They're not showing it. So, but good morning, uh, FBC, and uh, welcome once again to uh, this sanctuary and as we worship God together. Thanks to the, uh, the worship team, uh, led by Brother Chu Chiang and Sister Liz and Sister Corinne for reading the word to us. Give them a hand. Thank you. I hope it's not too late to wish um, all of you a happy new year. And very soon, in two weeks' time, another new year is coming, as we know, right? So I hope it's also not too late to uh, make resolutions. If you haven't already made your resolution, or if you have, can I add one more to your list? Can I add one more to your list? Right? There's this phrase that uh, we learn from our biblical interpretation caused by Dr. Carl Essary called Scripture Before Screen. Scripture Before Screen. Who have heard of this before? Those who have. Yo, where are the leaders who, are, <laughs> who went for the, the course? Right? Scripture Before Screen. This has, been, this has been stuck in my mind for a while now, right? And uh, it's been something that has, that has served as a reminder for me every morning before I start going down the trenches of work and social media. Although just like the guy in the photo, um, even our Bibles and our study tools today are on screen these days, right? So it's, it's sometimes useful to just have your physical Bible or your devotional materials in front of you uh, so that we won't get distracted uh, with the streams of pop-up messages demanding our attention. But it's, it's different if, uh, if it's Scripture in front of your screen and then that's the only thing allowed in this sanctuary today. So I'm setting the example, going on non-digital. Let's pray before we start. Gracious and merciful God, we come humbly and expectantly before your throne of grace, asking that we may have a fresh encounter with you through your word, which is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. May you refresh our hearts and increase our faith, just like the story of the Canaanite woman that we will delve into today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. I've entitled the sermon, <coughs> Faith in Heart, or Hard Places, pun intended, the priorities of great omega faith. Now, just to recap, <coughs> Jesus just finished the confrontation with the Pharisees and the scribes, isn't it, on the uh, ceremonial uncleanliness issue of the disciples not washing their hands before eating, thereby breaking the tradition of the elders, to which Jesus rebuked them, saying, what comes out of the heart? It's what comes out of the heart that defiles them, not what you eat or how you eat or what you do before you eat, which is merely religiosity. The disciples told Jesus that the Pharisees were offended. They were, they were pissed off with you, Jesus, right? As, as they did when Jesus uh, healed a man on the, on the Sabbath, right? Jesus was, but Jesus was not backing down at all. He but he definitely needed a break. So Jesus was withdrawing from the crowd. This is not uncommon for, for Jesus. In chapter 12, we remember in the few chapters before, Jesus withdrew from the Pharisees who were plotting to kill him after the discourse on the healing on the Sabbath. And again in chapter 14, upon hearing the beheading of John the Baptist, Jesus withdrew to a quiet place before the feeding of the 5,000. Here again, Jesus is withdrawing from the crowd together with his disciples. And this time, probably for the first time in Jesus' ministry, he is crossing the boundary of the Gentile territory. So he's moving up northwest, right, towards the region of Tyre and Sidon, the Bible says, possibly to avoid the confrontation and the, and the rising oppositions from the Jewish leaders and even Herod himself is looking for him still. There's no indication this was Jesus' regular missionary or preaching trip, but a secret mission nevertheless, as we will see in this story. There's a parallel passage in Mark chapter 7, almost the same, but Matthew gives a bit, a bit more details. <clears throat> but, but Mark tells us he entered the house wanting to keep his presence a secret, so he needed a rest, all right? <clears throat> 
Now, some background about Thai and Sidon. It is the, uh, as, we all, as we some of us know, it is the principal coastal cities of Phoenicia, part of what is known as southern Lebanon today, right? So, if you remember in chapter 11, where, I mean, I mean when, you know, when we last heard here the, the, the cities of Tyre and Sidon, in chapter 11, remember we, when I preached about John the Baptist's doubts about Jesus, about unbelief, Tyre and Sidon were compared to the unrepentant cities destroyed by God. This was prophesied in Isaiah 23. It is Gentile territory for sure. Right? Definitely not a place you want to go for a staycation with a warm welcome. Right? A getaway or, or more like a hideout maybe. So Jesus was entering the borders of the Phoenician region. We, we, we're not told if Jesus actually reached Tyre as far as the coast, uh, except that he went through the region and then later he would be going north around Phoenicia, towards Sidon, and then down again uh, through the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee into the region of the, of the Decapolis, which is predominantly Gentile population, where he would continue his ministry. So it's against this backdrop, the most unexpected story of faith begins. I hope you will learn four lessons today about faith, just like you have the four Ps of marketing, yeah? We have the four Ps of faith. The pursuit of a great God. We just sang about how great God is, the need of a Lord and Saviour. The second point, persistence amidst great obstacles when our faith is tested. And thirdly, pleasing God because of His great mercies, taking or trusting the Lord at His word. And finally, praising God for His great reward and rejoicing in His glory. So first, the pursuit of a great God and need of a Lord and Saviour. We read in verse 22, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity, in the vicinity of Phoenicia, came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. There's no social media at that time, you know, face, no Facebook or Meta, we call it today, no live tweeting, no Insta, or Google Map then, but this woman somehow was heard that Jesus was in town and rushed to meet him. She, she was able to find him. This, the Canaanite woman, the term Canaanite was used only here in the entire New Testament. Now, if a word is being used either the first time or only in that passage, you need to draw close attention, right? There will be more first, there will be more onlys. There will be two more onlys later that I will mention, so look out for it. Canaan, as we all know, is the Old Testament association with enemy cities that Israel was to conquer. Right? But Tyre and Sidon wasn't the cities that was, they were, they were conquered. In fact, they were destroyed because of unrepentance. The parallel passage in Mark tells us the woman was a Syro-Phoenician Greek. Together with the negative associations <clears throat> and the connotations of Old Testament, Tyre and Sidon, the unrepentant cities of Israel, we cause a traditional prejudice against the people in those regions. It's like how we associate <clears throat> today when I say Tanjung Rambutan. You know, you know what do we think of? Mental hospital, right? Or when I was growing up, uh, Sorry, lah, hopefully no one from here. Huh? Jinjang. When you mention Jinjang, what, what do you remember? Of course, now it's different. Huh? Jinjang is very developed now. It used to be gangster place, gangsterism, on, 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 which was rife. <clears throat> and how about Chao Kit? You mentioned Chao Kit, huh? and people think of drugs, red light district. Yeah? <clears throat> it's all what we call stereotyping. So, um, Tyre and Sidon, at the mention of it, people know, right? Not good place, right? Linking back to the preceding discourse of what is clean versus unclean, this woman would definitely be classified as an unclean pagan by the Jewish standards. One preacher quotes, huh? if Paul was the Hebrew of Hebrews, she is a Gentile of Gentiles. What are the chances of such a person approaching Jesus, let alone expecting Jesus to respond positively to her? Not to mention, this was right after the whole debate with the Pharisees around what is clean and what is unclean. Nevertheless, 
a desperate mother, possibly even a single mother, we don't know, of a suffering child. This child was demon-possessed. We don't even know what the actual disease is. Is it NBD? Is it, could it be a biological disorder? We don't know, but she, the Bible says she's, he, she's, the daughter is demon-possessed. And she would do whatever it takes to save a child. Now, many of us here are mothers, parents, and, and many, I believe, would have encountered similar situations of a sick child or a parent or a relative that, we, that is close to her, that we love, and can identify with this Canaanite mother, isn't it? When my, when my late mother was diagnosed stage 3 and 4 pancreatic cancer, we turned desperately to the Lord. We consulted many doctors, surgeons, and we were prepared to go all the way to Singapore to attempt a very risky and expensive surgery. When my son, my youngest son, Ryan, was hardly six months old, he had to undergo surgery to remove uh, an infected lymph node that was turning necrotic. It was under his chin. He was hardly six months old. And, and the fever didn't subside because of that necrotic lymph node. Right? For, it hasn't subsided for close to two weeks. My wife and I were obviously concerned and desperately wanted to get the most trusted surgeon to perform the delicate surgery. We prayed earnestly to God together with family and friends. This Canaanite mother came desperately to Jesus don't care, don't know any of the Jewish customs or protocols, didn't wear masks, never wash hands. The only one thing she, she was sure of, Jesus was her only hope. Jesus was her only hope. And she cries, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. She calls him Lord, son of David. This is the term um, that Matthew uses the most to describe our earthly Jesus as the royal Messiah from the house of David. Now contrast that with the Pharisees, who were supposed to be the first to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Right? I mean, if there's anyone, it would be the guru of the OT laws, right? But because Jesus didn't follow protocols or tradition, instead, Jesus always challenged their teachings. They opposed him with a passion, calling him all kinds of names. He has a demon in him. When he performed healing miracles, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of sinners when he was eating with tax collectors. But the Canaanite woman with a childlike faith calls Jesus Lord, Son of David, Christ, the Messiah. And this is even before Peter's confession of Christ, which we will study later in chapter 16. Remarkable, remarkable. She begged for mercy for God to heal her demon-possessed child. The phrase, have mercy upon me rings a bell because it's often quoted in the Psalms as part of a prayer for penitence and deliverance. J.C. Rowell, an English evangelical Anglican bishop, uh, writes about the daughter who was in need of help. He says, hopeless and desperate as his daughter's case appeared, she had a praying mother. She had a praying mother and where there is a praying mother, there is hope. The Canaanite woman who came out of nowhere was probably a nobody. In fact, someone who is probably despised by Jewish standards knew how great a God Jesus was and pursued Jesus with a passion. And this leads me to the second point, persistence amidst great obstacles. And our faith is tested. Well, how did Jesus respond? Jesus gave the silent treatment, we call it. Eh? Not a single word, the Bible says. If this was a Zoom call, you would check whether, hey, is it Jesus unmuted? Is it Jesus muted? No. <laughs> muted? No, unmuted, but not saying a word. Have you had that experience in your prayers sometimes? I have. And there's a lesson to learn here too. When God is sometimes silent, it does not mean he is not listening to our cries. We see this from many of the Psalms. Remember Prophet Habakkuk, Habakkuk's complaint right at the start of the book. 
He says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Obviously, it's not that God is not listening, but Habakkuk feels he's not getting a response from God, at least not what he's expecting. For some of us, it could be praying for our marriage or family, healing upon both yourselves and a family member who is severely ill, and we know there are many who are. For those of you who are single, praying for a partner as you struggle with loneliness and unmet needs, or just unrest, just no peace within the family. Brothers and sisters, let us be assured that God knows us and hears our prayers and desires. He promises in Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. and Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. God will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jesus is still silent. What do the disciples do? As usual, they chime in, right? The woman was crying out, in some translations, says, shouting to the point of annoyance. The disciples is what the Hokkien say, betahan already. Cannot tahan already. Right? If this again is there was a Zoom call, it's easy, huh? you just mute her. Lah. <laughs> But you can't. She physically in your face. Physical service has started. You know, no need to register some more. Just come right in. On one side, you've got a begging mother. On the other side, the disciples being protective of Jesus as always. were begging too. You know, please. Maybe, maybe have to use private chat. Private chat, what's that? Jesus, please cut off. Cut her off. You come a long way. You're tired, you need a rest, so do we, right? By the way, you're going to get into great trouble if, you, if, you, if anyone sees you talking to this Gentile woman. It's a very similar pattern, isn't it? When With the feeding of the 5,000 where they told Jesus to send the crowds away, right? So that they can settle their hunger themselves. What the Cantonese call, sick GK, let them sick GK, right? I call this quick fixes, right? I think I'm guilty of that too sometimes, right? We depend too much on our own wisdom, our own knowledge and our self-righteousness to fix our own situations instead of waiting upon the Lord. Now, there are two views of what the disciples could mean by sending her away. You know? Of course, the, the, you know, the most obvious one would be to say no, lah, and just ask her to leave, dismiss her. But the, the Greek word for send away, apuluon, could also mean set free. So uh, the disciples could mean just, just give her what she wants so she can leave us alone. Right, again, quick fixes. They may have remembered the healing of the centurion's servant, also a Gentile. And remember, Jesus, I think you can do it, right? Just say the word, the demon-possessed daughter will be healed and then we can get on with life, right? Most commentators, most commentators favour the this, this second meaning because of what Jesus will finally answer in verse 24. He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, we're not sure if the Canaanite woman was still listening in, but he's at least speaking to his disciples, reminding them that uh, of, of his instructions in Matthew chapter 10 as part of the sending of the 12. You remember, Jesus says, do not go among here. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town in Samaritans, uh, of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. It's like Jesus saying, um, no, it's not in my JD, at least for now. Uh, and not, not, not in yours too. It's supposed to be a holiday here, not work. Right? At first glance, Jesus may appear racist. Isn't it? When you read this, strange, right? Um, or at least impartial. It's all too contradictory to what we know of God's salvation and how His love for all. I mean, we have, we have the benefit of hindsight, the whole Bible with us, right? First Timothy chapter 2, for example, says, God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And Romans 2, 11, for God does not show favoritism. How do we reconcile this? 
So remember in, in God's salvation history, the covenant with Abraham was first was given first to the children of Israel. Sorry. And then to the Gentiles. There's an order in which salvation will reach the ends of the world through the promised Messiah, Christ Jesus. We remember Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus says, You Samaritans worship what you do not, you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth for they are the kind of worshippers that the Father seek. This is why Paul also said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So putting this into context, Jesus is reminding or teaching the disciples that his immediate mission, his priority, was to the Israelites, the Jews. But his kingdom will eventually reach the ends of the earth. It was not until after his death and resurrection in Matthew 28, verse 19, where Jesus gave the great commission to the disciples to go out into the nations, making disciples of all nations, including surely the Gentiles. So Jesus is still not saying no. It's as if he's having this two-pronged approach. On the one hand, he's trying to draw out the faith of the Canaanite woman. In parallel, he's trying to teach the disciples about who he really is and what his salvation plan entails. Now, after this short lecture, we don't hear any more of it from the disciples. We just stand at the corner. Okay? They, they muted already. Okay? But the woman presses on. Right? The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. She is undeterred. The woman came even closer to Jesus. You can see in the picture, Jesus is almost like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I come so close, right? And she was kneeling. The, the, the Greek word for kneel is proskuneo, which literally means to revere or to pay homage by kissing the hand, right? Prostrating oneself. It's the same word that we use for worship. That is the posture in which she came kneeling, prostrating before Jesus, saying, Lord, help me. Three simple words. Lord, help me. Speaks volumes because she recognises, firstly, her helpless estate. Reminds us of the Beatitudes of blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek. She also recognises that only Jesus can and will help. Now, at this point, you would have thought Jesus would oblige, as he did in most of the other healing miracles, with that amount of persistence, that amount of sincerity. But Jesus continues to test her faith. In James 1, we, we are encouraged to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And that perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And this brings to the third point, pleasing Him because of His great mercies, taking the Lord at His word. Jesus replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Ouch! Another roadblock in your face. Bum! Just, it's like Jesus slamming the door again. Not only does Jesus seem unrelenting in his stance about the children of Israel, referring to the previous verse about the lost ship of Israel, but calling her a Gentile dog seems to be very heartless. Very harsh, isn't it? Even downright rude. What's going on here? You might be thinking that this is, not, this is Jesus not in his elements. You know, If there was any pride left at this point, this would have been the last straw that broke the camel's back. Dogs, Hebrew, Caleb. Interesting, huh? the Joshua and Caleb. That's the meaning of dog. That's the Hebrew name for dogs. In the Old Testament, are viewed as wild, wild and of lowly status. Demonstrate predatory behaviours in their quest for survival, including eating of dead bodies and licking blood. We hear this in the entire First and Second Kings. 
And, you know, the, uh, the, the example we remember is Jezebel's flesh was eaten by dogs. Calling a person a dog means he is treated with contempt, an enemy to the psalmist. The phrase dead dog is also used to mean misleading prophets. It's not a nice word. Okay, in the, even in the New Testament, calling a person a dog, in Greek is kuon, meant that the person was considered evil, unclean. But only in this story, this is the second only, eh? only in this story and the metaphor in, in Matthew and Mark, dog was used in the reduced form, the diminutive form. Here only in the story, right? The, the, the word for dogs is not your regular kuon, which means large dogs. Eh? This is puppy, you know? It refers to a domesticated house pet, but it's not about the cuteness that Jesus is trying to say here. It's still considered worthless, right? So the, the para passage in Mark chapter 7 was a little bit more gracious, right, in this, in this word here, right? Before there's a preamble, before, the, before the, um, the verse, it is not right to take the children's brain and toss it to the dogs, right? In Mark chapter 7, verse 27, it says, First, let the children eat all they want. First, let them eat all they want. Then, and, and he says, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to dogs. As a preamble, it's as if Jesus has tipped her off, you know, and saying, first, let them eat first. So the, the woman is almost hopeful, is even more hopeful and saying, you mean there's a chance that I can still eat? Right? Keller in his book, in book King's Cross wrote, um, what Jesus is saying to the Syrophoenician woman is, please understand, there's an order here. I'm going to Israel first, and then the Gentiles, the other nations, later. Instead of being offended, this woman, almost catching Jesus at his, word, his own words, grabbed hold of that opportunity and would not take no or even later for an answer. She says, yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Have you heard of the, of the, of the, the, the phrase, beggars are not choosers? Yeah? She's begging. She feels like, I'm not choosing. Take whatever. I'll take whatever the, the crumbs that falls from the table. She understood grace and mercy. You remember in Exodus 33, verse 19, this was also quoted by Paul in Romans 9, 15. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It is 100% God's prerogative. Still in her prostrated posture, almost like the house dog, right, that Jesus was referring to, he's like, yeah, 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 I'm like a dog already, you know, calls him Lord for the third time and appropriately adds, oh, sorry, yeah? I've passed this, right? here. Calls him Lord for the third time and appropriately adds the master's table. She says, sorry, I think I may be missing a, yeah, this one, sorry. He <laughs> says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Even the dogs will eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And she cleverly adds the word master. Right? Jesus didn't say that. That's, as if to say, that's more than enough for me. As if to say, I'd rather be a slave to you, Jesus, eating the crumbs, the children's leftovers under your table than even the choicest food offered by the other pagan gods. We learn from Romans 6 in Gamma that you are either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. This woman chose Jesus, the righteousness of God, the one who can save her from her sins and has the power to cast out demons. Did you know that this verse was the inspiration of uh, some of you who are from more traditional uh, you know, evangelical churches? Remember the... A uh, Prayer of Humble Access, <clears throat> written by um, the Anglican reformer Thomas Cranmer in the first book of Common Prayer. It was adapted by many Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and all the other Christian Eucharistic liturgies. 
The example that I'm familiar with uh, is in the United Methodist Hymna. I'm from a Methodist background. And this prayer is part of one of the Holy Communion on the Lord's Supper service, especially because of the reference to bread, which is part of the elements. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. This desperate woman, the mother of a sick child, persistently wrestled with Jesus, just as how Jacob wrestled with God, you remember, and didn't let go until God blessed him. She took Jesus at his word, whatever that was, that was said by Christ, he said, yes it is, I would love to please you, Lord. And finally, this leads to the, to the, to the, last, to the last P, praising God for his great reward, rejoicing in his glory. Then Jesus said to her, oh, woman, the NIV took out the word oh, huh? but there's actually a, a word oh in Greek, huh? Oh, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And the daughter was healed at that moment. There's an emotional expression of wonder. Jesus commended the woman's great faith. The word is mega. Mega in Greek means, well, this is big, yeah? Exceeding the norm. Exceeding the expectations. Jesus patiently drew out the woman's faith. And she passed the test with flying colours. The only other time that Jesus commended a, a Gentile's faith was that of the Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8, if you remember. But it is only here. This is the third only. Eh? The first only was Canaanite. The second only was puppy, dog referred to as puppy. And now here, mega faith used together. Of course, the word mega was used in, in many places in the New Testament, but together with faith was the only time. Ironically, both times when Jesus commanded faith so great uh, was used for Gentiles, for the, for the Gentiles' faith. Now, compare that, contrast that with the little faith that Jesus always complains of his disciples. You remember when Jesus was coming a storm, the disciples were so afraid, and Jesus says, so how little faith you have. When Jesus was walking on the water and called Peter to walk towards him, you know, I think, uh, you know, Elder, you then preached on that, he wavered and he says, you of little faith, right? And many more examples we will see of the disciples of lack lacking of faith, right? The reward for her great faith, the Canaanite woman's great faith, is the instant healing of her daughter. Her request was granted. This was a turning point for the Gentile community, starting from the exemplary great faith of this Canaanite woman, breaking all barriers of entry into the Gentile world. In Hebrews 11.6, we read, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, must believe all that God is, all that He is, and that He rewards those who earnestly Seek him. And then in verse and, in, and, in the, and then in the later part of, of this passage in verse 29 to 31, we see Jesus' healing grace being extended to a great Gentile crowd who came to him. The lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, etc. And they praise the God of Israel. This gives an indication that it is the Gentiles that is praising the God of Israel. The Jews are not praising Jesus, the Gentiles are. But by the way, do you know that all of us here are Gentiles too, right? The dogs that eat the crumbs under the table. Last I checked, none of us here have Jewish blood, right? Got No. <laughs> but I would like to make an important point about healing. Since you can't run away, this chapter talks about healing. And I want to say, God heals through both earthly and supernatural means. Robert Hampshire, an author and pastor, points out that God created our body's ability to fight sickness. He created the men and women who, be who became medical workers and scientists. We are blessed to have doctors in our midst too, right? Dr. Peter, Dr. Ian, in the FBC family. God can 
and will work through medicine and doctors, and he, or he can choose to answer our fervent prayers and work supernaturally, but still in accordance with his permissible will to remove diseases, whether immediately or over time. Jesus referenced physicians too. He said it is not the healthy who needs a doctor. There are doctors in Jesus' time too, but the sick. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, we also, Jesus also explained how the injured man's wounds were treated medically. Paul urged his protege, Timothy, to no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, himself is a doctor by profession. Rejecting scientific treatment for illness sometimes means rejecting the medium by which God chooses to heal. We don't have to search far for examples of faith in hard places, in hard places. They're right here in FBC, and I would like to quote our sister Tan Le Siu. Right? Is she here in our midst? Tan Le Siu. She shared her journey of faith in FBC today, last April, most of you remember, after she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma cancer or bone marrow cancer the year before. She was told the year before that she had only six months to live. She shared her testimony uh, in the August 29 service of how trusting in God's promises and providence, coupled with persistent prayers from family, friends, church, and the skills of doctors and nurses resulted in a successful bone marrow transplant. In many ways, the, the healing was partially supernatural as well. She was sharing that how she was spared from severe oral ulcers, which is common for such surgery. Her appetite regained only after 12 days versus three weeks usually. She was discharged two weeks versus three to four weeks overnight. She's, she's, although she's still struggling with low blood cell count and is still undergoing follow-up treatment, she's well on the road to recovery. And we're still fervently praying for her. I just spoke to her a couple of days ago and just hearing her on the phone is a deep encouragement of genuine faith in our merciful God who hears our prayers and who heals in accordance to His great purpose and plan. Amen? What a testament of God's grace. Recently, at the Wash Next service, many testimonies of God's healing grace were given as well. Sister Corinne Au, who shared about how she was delivered from COVID and while she continues to battle the effects of what we call long COVID symptoms, including insomnia, she can't sleep. She declares at the end of that testimony, if you remember, God is great. He says, and it just ended there, God is great. A brother who prefer not to be named, but we, know, we might know who, who doesn't know, know him, who is on a road to recovery after surviving a stroke, shared how this test of faith was a humbling experience for him. He acknowledges that God has been speaking to me. Iris Ng, who went through an open heart surgery and a bypass, she reminded me when I was chatting with her, open heart surgery and the bypass in one go, shared how at the T-junction of her most critical, desperate point in her life, she surrendered to God, quoting, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I also spoke personally to, uh, with Brother David Ng, who recently also recovered from COVID, and he shared with me his experience. He wrote, um, and I quote, I learned, oh sorry, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I learned surrendering my situation to God is the only way to have joy. I learned surrendering my situation to God is the only way to have joy. I'm sure many of us share the same joy in the Lord when we experience His grace. By the way, everyone who shared during the Wash Next service, if you remember, attributed their healing their recovery to prayers offered by all FBC brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's keep up this important spiritual discipline to come and pray and attend prayer meetings. For the rest of us, 
In fact, for all of us, we are work in progress. Or shall I say, faith in progress. Faith in progress. Until we see the Lord face to face, just like the Canaanite woman, we will continue to pursue our great God, recognizing that we need His grace and mercies each day of our lives. We will continue to persist and persevere even when God seems silent, when our faith is being tested. We will continue to please Him, acknowledging His great mercies and that He will show mercy and compassion to whom He will show mercy. And He is a good God, trusting in His promises and His word. We will continue to praise Him for His glory every time He rewards us, every time He answers our prayers when we seek Him with all our heart. But we may also continue to face doubts, questions, such as, such as these may arise. Why me? Why are some prayers answered and others don't? Why doesn't God heal everyone? None of us have all the answers. I don't, neither do all your elders and leaders. But what I would like to leave us with is four principles taken from an article in Christianity.com entitled, Why Doesn't God Heal Everyone? Why Does He Not Heal Everyone? By Candice Lucy. You can look it up through the link provided. You can take a snapshot. To, together with the application questions, this can also be further discussed and prayed over in your respective live groups later on. So the first is, she says, God has the power to heal. That we know very well, as we have seen today, and all of what we have learned through Matthew thus far. And secondly, God can and will use suffering to accomplish His plan and be glorified through it. God can and will use suffering to accomplish His plan and be glorified through it. We see this in the Old Testament examples of Joseph, of Job. But even remember the Apostle Paul himself wrote about a thorn in his flesh. We remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, he says, I was given a thorn in my flesh. He even says this is a messenger from Satan. Right? We don't know what this thorn in my flesh is. A lot of people have tried to guess what it is. Theologians have tried to say maybe it's due to his eyesight. You know, there are some passages that say he, he needs large thorns, so maybe it's his eyesight. We don't know. There's not enough evidence to know what that is, but a thorn that he pleaded three times with the Lord to take it away from me. God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I would boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Thirdly, we are in no position to judge what is fair, what is not. His thoughts, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways, isn't it? Isaiah 55, verse 8. But He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. He is all-present. He is all-powerful. And He is all-loving. He knows what's best for us. He loves us. And finally, and probably the most important is, God is more concerned with spiritual healing. God is more concerned with spiritual healing. Underpinning the faith of the Canaanite woman, as we saw earlier, was the recognition that Jesus was first and foremost her saviour who would save her from her sins. Otherwise, why would, he, why would she call her the Messiah? Right? Why not call her doctor? Right? And then only as the Lord who has the power to heal and perform miracles. This was unambiguous when Christ healed the paralytic. You remember in Matthew 9, three chapters before, right? Christ first said, your sins are forgiven, and this triggered a lot of opposition from the, from the Pharisees again, right? He said, your sins are forgiven before he even said, get up, take up your mat, and go home. God is more concerned with spiritual healing. And so, <clears throat> in, in closing, I would like to leave you with Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2. That the ultimate example 
of the greatest faith, the ultimate example of the most mega faith ever known is Christ Jesus himself. Hebrews 12 says he's the pioneer, the author, the author of faith. He's the one who blazed the trail in obedience to the Father's will. There at Gethsemane, he prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not I. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is also the perfecter of our faith. Focusing on the joy that is that he is certain will come. He faithfully endured the gruesome and tortuous death on the cross and all the humiliation, the shame that came with it until it is perfectly finished. The reward as we experience today, the reward for, for, for Christ first and then us was the promised resurrection victory over sin and death. Christ is now seated at the right hand on the throne of the Father, ruling over His kingdom in eternal glory. The free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord is the ultimate reward of great faith. Great faith is therefore denying ourselves, taking up the cross daily, and following Him. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let us respond in this beautiful song that we have, we have been learning in the past couple of weeks. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.